everyone. Welcome to the Film for Fans podcast, the podcast from movie fans for movie fans. I am your host, Ryan Dunham, joined by Rob Dunham. Hi, everybody. Ah, man, we are fresh off the little sleep following the tremendous U.S. soccer win. Yes. 3 nothing over Mexico, beat like it down. should be. Beat down the proportions. <laughs> this is not a beat down podcast. This is not a beat. It should be a beat should down be. podcast. Should this be. is not a beat down podcast. <laughs> But it couldn't help but mention that once yeah. again. Uh, <laughs> US three, Mexico zero. Glories. Face off zero. Canada next. Yep. Conference domination. They, they even threw in the towel. They stopped the fight early. Yep. So. <laughs> ah, yes. But we must move on to our chief export of this podcast, namely movie takes. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Right Hot and set. fresh. Action. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, but of course we have an excellent show for you. We are going to talk about the box office. We are going to bring back movie philosophizing and we'll have our watch list. A lot of stuff coming on. Rob, we'll start off with the box office. Transformers, number one in the country. Not a huge shock. Mm -hmm. 61 million is the number for Transformers. Spider-Man Across the Universe, uh, 55 million in its second week so that hits right about the 54 mark so it's right about average mm-hmm. for second week drop mm-hmm. off uh that one is up over 225 million now uh the little mermaid did 23 million guardians of the galaxy did seven and boogeyman also did seven um and your comment here is about the boogeyman only a 42 percent drop mm-hmm. in the boogeyman's uh, from week one to week two, which is well below the average, yeah. as we've talked about. So you take holistically the 25 million it's made so far, and you look at more at like what you would have expected. Yeah. I think for an opening weekend type number. Yeah. And so recap your reasoning for why you thought it would have a low drop. So I, I my my uh, theory that I postulated was that a good amount of people would have gone to see the Boogeyman shows instead to go see Across the Spider Verse um, with their families, with their friends. Um, I was in the fortunate situation with um, the the movie pass subscription I have to be able to go see both. Um, but I know a lot of people probably didn't do the same. So um, if you had to choose one or the other, you're probably going to go to the one where you're around more people, whether it's your family or some other friends who wouldn't go see a horror movie. But I, I do think there was clearly some crossover there. Yeah. Oh, uh, and sure. audiences. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. And uh, I think I think you're right on that. I think that is what we see in the numbers. And usually when something doesn't have a dramatic drop off in the 55 to 60 percent range, um, then, you know, that something something's askew. Mm -hmm. And and I think there probably was enough crossover between those two audiences to um, mitigate the the obviously probably a pretty low number for a yeah. man in week one so i i look into the numbers super deeply but um did you see any of the projections on transformers what they were thinking i did you not I did? no i did not that doesn't seem like a very high number yeah so, yeah i was probably about what i was anticipating mm-hmm. the movie making i think that it's a tired franchise yeah um but no, I did not look at projections to see what the projections would. I can go back and check yeah. and see what they were anticipating on that one. Uh, but yeah, I think nothing else is super surprising. Um, Full Mermaid has dramatically slowed down. Mm-hmm. So that was one where a huge monster opening weekend and then has has scaled back each week uh, fairly severely um, to the point where uh, two weeks of Spider Verse has almost basically caught it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but three weeks of Little Mermaid. So make of that what you will. Uh, any other comments on the box office results? Uh, I, I guess, like you said, I don't think there was anything super surprising. Yeah, in there. Yeah, for sure. Uh, the question is, will a sixty-one million opening week does Transformers make it to hundred million? Hmm, it's a good question. I, I, I think it still will, even if you have a fifty percent drop off. That's another thirty, which is the ninety. So you're probably gonna have more than a fifty percent drop off. So you're probably gonna be maybe eighty, eighty-five after yeah. two weeks. I think it's capped probably about one hundred twenty mil. Mm-hmm. 
I think it's that's about the market cap that you're going to see yeah. for this one. Uh, and those are big budget films. I didn't look up. Let me see if I can find the budget for that. Uh, Transformers, Rise of the Beast. Um, yeah, because these are usually pretty big budget films, especially with all the CGI that they have to do. And a lot of budget goes into marketing also. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, let's see. Budget was $200 million. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it'll end up breaking even uh, maybe world. It's inside. it's worldwide gross is already 197 million. So mm-hmm. it's basically a break-even point in week one given yeah. the international audience. So this is clearly one that has a much bigger international appeal than it does domestically. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of that's kind of fascinating. Uh I wouldn't have thought that Transformers is a super universal franchise but yeah apparently and 200 million seems like a high number that's a really high budget yeah oh man um on a slightly sad note i read an article this week how this weekend was supposed to be originally a uh, a star trek release mm. a couple years ago they had this date this past weekend's date as a as a release for a new star trek movie but then all of them have gone to mm. by the wayside and so and re- reshuffling, they ended up reshuffling. You can say they've gone into darkness. Yes, you can. <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> All right. Well, let's move on from the box office results. And uh, we got three movies of note coming out this weekend. Uh, number one is, of course, The Flash. Um, so this is the, the long-awaited and much consternated uh, DC product. And uh, this one is Barry Allen uses his super speed to change the past, but his attempts to save his family creates a world without superheroes, forcing him to race for his life in order to save the world. Um, And you have uh, Sasha Kala, Ben Affleck, Ezra Miller, of course, plays the Flash. Michael Keaton returns as Batman, which is the much anticipated and and the prime focus of the marketing campaign. Uh, And Michael Shannon is back. Uh, reprising his role as Zod, so uh, this is this is really it's really an interesting movie. We'll get to it uh, a little bit more in a second because there's a lot going on here. Uh, the second one, Elemental. Elemental is the latest uh, Disney Pixar release, and this follows Ember and Wade in a city where fire, water, land, and air residents live together. The film journeys Av- along Avatar. <laughs> yeah, I know, right. <laughs> Film journeys along an unlikely pair, Ember and Wade, in a city where those live together. And uh, the fire young woman and the go with the flow guy are about to discover something elemental, how much they actually have in common. Uh, and the voice actors here are Leia Lewis, Mamadou Afi, Ronnie Del Carmen, and Sheila Omni are the primary uh, voice actors in that one. And uh, the third one is The Blackening. Seven black friends go away for the weekend and end up trapped in a cabin with a killer who has a vendetta. Will their street smart and knowledge of horror movies help them stay alive? Probably not. <laughs> so this is this is kind of one of those, uh, those uh, dark horror comedies, mm-hmm. uh, spoof comedy type, uh, type things. And this one stars... Antoinette Robertson, Dwayne Perkins, and Shaniqua Walls Namdi um, are your main cast on that one. All right, Rob, three movies. Uh, what do you do? You have before we get into the Flash. Do you have any comments mm-hmm. on either of the other two movies? Well, I'm planning on probably seeing all three of them, mm. which is not normal for uh, what's coming out in the box office, but. Um, Elemental, my kids have been wanting to see since they saw the first trailer for it. I've actually wanted to see it since I saw the first trailer for it mm. because I really enjoy well done animation, and this looks like very well done animation. My my thought on this is um, it is awfully similar a premise to uh, the one uh, now I'm blanking out on the title, the one with the emotions mm-hmm. or the different inside emotions. Out. Are, inside yeah. out, yes, thank you. That is a very it seems to have a very similar framework. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm and premise as that one um so i wonder if they'll end up covering some of the same ground they did in those two Mm -hmm. um but yeah 
and uh the blackening i i like horror movies obviously <laughs> and i like comedy and dwayne perkins is like uh one of my favorite stand-up comedians mm-hmm. so it'll be fun to see him in a movie role that kind of spoof horror comedy is almost its own subgenre at mm-hmm. this point with the number of them there's yeah. been um from Shaun of the dead to uh oh now i'm blanking out the ones that were m- mock the scream movies yep um, um why can't i remember the title <laughs> <laughs> and i can't either and i'm like yeah now yeah i know exactly what you're talking yeah. about yeah uh you know which yeah. ones we're talking scary about. movie scary movie um yeah. and then you had cabin in the woods yes. a little more higher concept i think yeah the same idea mm-hmm but that kind of spoof horror comedy is really is really a, a subgenre. I'd say. I'm, a, I'm actually uh, talking to my wife now. We might have a double feature tonight where I go see Elemental earlier in the evening and then go watch Michael Keaton's Batman featuring the Flash. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> later this evening. Yeah. Interesting. I like it. Yeah. Double feature at the movies. Got a yeah. lot. How many times have you done that, by the way? Two movies in one day. Uh. It, I'm going to go ahead and not count drive-ins because that's cheating. That's true. That is Because true. a drive-in, you pay to see two movies right. typically back to back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So beyond that, I think I've probably done it, I don't know, three or four times. Okay. I would, my life. I would say I can easily remember twice. I don't remember how, if I've done it any other times, mm-hmm. but I can easily remember twice. But yeah, another, another shout out. We've talked about this before. In fact, it was one of the very first episodes of our podcast. Yeah. Uh, if you do have a chance to go check out a drive-in somewhere mm-hmm. this summer, that's a really fun experience, particularly because typically you're paying a low lower amount of money to watch yeah. two movies back to back. And most of the places that I've been to at least ha- usually have like concession stand, bring it some like nice hot food. You can have dinner for pretty cheap and watch two movies yeah. and be outside in nature. Like it's, I would say for most people, it's probably a really good experience. Now that wouldn't be the case for everyone, but I I highly recommend it. And if you're in our area, it's been nice and cool mm-hmm. summer so far, so take advantage of it. Yeah, yeah. And even uh, a lot of a lot of uh, local parks too are showing movies. Mm-hmm. Certain nights they'll blow up like a big inflatable screen, and some of them even bring in food trucks and things like that. So just yeah. be on the lookout for your local events calendar. For you never know what's going on. Yeah, for sure. You know, there are movie series going on like every week they're mm-hmm. throwing a movie in the park. So yeah. Definitely. Good good shout out there. Uh so let's uh let's get to the flash. Uh so a lot happening here. Obviously, like the DC shakeup, James Gunn is now in charge. Ezra Miller went off the deep end, sort of kind of rehabilitated, maybe a little bit, mm-hmm. not sure. Uh, they're publicly launching support for Ezra Miller continuing in this role, but honestly, what else would they say leading up to a big release of one of their films? Um, it seems as though they're going forward with The Flash uh, coming into uh, the new James Gunn DC. Uh, a lot at stake here, the return of Michael Keaton as Batman. Um, you've got some some alternate universe type mm-hmm. stuff here. Uh, the trailers have been very well received. The movie has been pretty well reviewed mm-hmm. so far. What do you make of the Flash? I mean, it's this juxtaposition, right? Because we're talking about this dude. I don't know if he would, be, if they would be okay with me calling them a dude. But anyway, anyway, um, that's a whole another podcast. <laughs> you know, uh, they're kind of a crazy person. Yeah. Right. Um. But at the same time, I've all these trailers that I've been watching for this movie. Like, I'm excited to see this movie. Like, yeah, I it I looks you. like a good movie. It does, and it's hard to, it's kind of hard to hold that mentally against like everything we've seen and read about what Ezra has done. Yeah, you know, because in a lot of ways, this movie seems like it's going to be really good, but also seems like it's going to be very self-contained in the end. Because we don't know what they're going to do with Ezra. Yeah. And just the way the story is is lined up, to me, it really feels like this is like a standalone movie for Michael Keaton. Like, I don't see him going beyond this. Mm-hmm. So I see him really, like, 
I think he's going to, he's going to act, he's going to like ham, ham the crap out of this. And yeah. act this <laughs> like, I'm sure he's been dying to mm-hmm. be Batman again. Yeah. So I think he's going to, I think he's going to be awesome. Cause I think he's, yeah. I think he's, you're going to see his passion mm-hmm. for the character. You can even see it just in the trailer. Oh yeah, like, for sure. Um, So does he die at the end of this? Like what happens? Because I don't, I don't see him going mm-hmm. beyond this as Batman. Yeah. I, I agree. This seems like it seems like the end of the old DC to me. Mm-hmm. It's what it seems. It seems like a wrap up in the end of the old DC. However, I think by the nature of it, this script was not written that way originally. Now I know we've done some they've done some editing to it to take out Henry Cavill to take out Wonder Woman because they're not proceeding forward with those two characters. Uh however, that universe is still the universe that this film is still. Yeah. So it will be really fascinating to see if anything goes forward, what goes forward. Um, and we talked about this this a little bit when we we did a we did a longer feature on Ezra and what was going on mm. a while back, but it's it's always a big decision about what to do with a movie like this. Cause in some ways, continuing forward is almost an endorsement of that actor who's the lead tent peg role in this mm. one. However, like and lots of people worked on this film lots and lots of people put their time and their energy and their effort into it and it feels in some ways unjust to disable all of their work Mm -hmm. with it along with it because one person is a crazy person yeah (laughs) part so that's tough that is part of the problem is that regardless what you feel about the person's um personal life yeah really good as the flash <laughs> and that's been and, yeah. you know, and that makes this really a difficult yeah. situation i'm sure for the executives who are trying to figure mm-hmm. out what to do with this character because i i would really argue that he's been the best version of the flash um as an actor because as an actor you're just you're doing your job yeah um yeah, like I if, if I if I had to sum it up, I would say this movie to me going into it really feels like it's going to be almost a time capsule for this era of DC, like you mm-hmm. were saying. Yeah, and I I think it can end up being a really good movie. I think it could be very well received. I think it can make a lot of money, but then I could also see it not going anywhere after that. Yeah, because I don't know where you do go after this. But also, let's face it: this thing makes enough money. That could be a washover yeah. for that character continuing. Yeah, it could be. I and what, what <laughs> what's it interesting to me too is you've got Ben Affleck, who I would argue is one of the less great Batmans, with Michael Keaton, who a lot of people think is the best Batman together in the same movie. <laughs> but I also I I think I really do think and um, Ben Affleck has been unduly served i agree by a lot of yeah. how this whole thing has happened because yeah. when we did see um you know as much as it may have been over the top or unnecessary when we saw Zack snyder's cut mm-hmm. of the movie ben affleck was not bad as batman no now so me saying he's probably not one of the best ones mm-hmm. there have been a lot of really good ones that's yeah. not really <laughs> like a huge that's, i'm not yeah. i'm not yeah, yeah, yeah. criticizing him mm-hmm. And I think it's a product of you had possibly the most legendary Batman trilogy, um, something that took superhero movies to new heights. And it wasn't that long until he had to he had to step into yeah. the role of Batman. I don't think they left enough time for that people to be ready for a new one. So it's inevitably you're going to have a drop off from what Christopher Nolan did to a re a redo of Batman in films that had their issues. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So it is what it is, but yeah, I, I I wonder if it if it is well served by cutting out um like the Henry Cavill yeah character and um the Gal Gadot character mm-hmm. because to me including her in the new Shazam movie was pointless yeah so will taking them out of the new Flash movie make it seem more cohesive and more of its own thing mm-hmm. um. Because I think if you would have left her out of Shazam entirely, nothing about the movie would have changed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, box office prediction. What do you think it makes? This is like, this is probably one of the, this is probably the hardest one, I think, to predict that we've had because mm -hmm. I really could see it going either way. But I do think that a lot of people will be interested by one, Michael Keaton coming back, and mm -hmm. two, the trailers have been slick, and it does seem like it's a good movie. So, uh, as much as DC has struggled, I still, I would, I would have a very hard time believing it's going to make less than um, seventy-five million to eighty million dollars opening weekend. I'm going bullish on this one. I think it does a hundred. Okay. Yeah, I think it does a hundred. I think there's enough buzz about it, um, and we're. I don't think Transformers is a big factor in this one. I think we're and we're several weeks removed from into the Spider Verse, mm -hmm. so I think most of the people who've wanted to see that have seen it, and so I think I think it's going to do a hundred. Now here, here I, I want to ask a, a secondary question. So yeah. we have um, Transformers, we have um, across the Spider Verse still mm -hmm. in the box office. We have Little Mermaid still in the box yeah. office. We have the Flash now coming out. Mm -hmm. Disney Pixar movies have traditionally done very well. Yeah. So where does this leave Elemental? What what, a, what does Elemental question. do? I I don't think this is a hit for I don't think it's a hit. For, yeah, and I think a lot of that is Disney due Pixar. to the what everything else is out. I also think it's due they've not been in a good run. Mm -hmm. They just haven't. They yeah. haven't been in a good run. Um you're not seeing the old Pixar. Mm -hmm. Now, not to say that some of the movies themselves haven't necessarily been decent movies, uh, but I think the bloom is off the rose. I think Disney's influence has had a lot to do with that. Um, so I'm 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 guessing it does third so, 35. So I want I want to look at something first before we okay. before we make our predictions there. See if I can if this will come out here. Mm. Okay. Okay. What you got? So of the movies that have actually premiered in the theater, because obviously we had um, Luca, Soul, um, and Turning Red, which did not premiere in the theater. They right, were right. Disney um, Plus exclusives. These are the last few Disney Pixar movies mm -hmm. that have actually been in the movie theater. Um, so if you go back, I'm not going to include Incredibles 2 or Toy Story 4, because those are... Those are tentpole massive. franchises that already have Okay, them. but the movie Onward yeah. had a budget of 200 million dollars mm -hmm. and it opening weekend was 39 yeah okay that was march 6 2020 yeah now, obviously there's some extenuating circumstances yeah, yeah, yeah. there right mm -hmm. um the most recent one that we can look at is lightyear mm -hmm. which debuted with 50.6 million yeah opening weekend and we know there was a lot of controversy yeah. around that which kept the number down for sure so that number theoretically could have been could have been decently higher than yeah. that so Looking at those numbers, I I, th I really think Elemental does at least 40. Because if even Lightyear, mm -hmm. which had all this criticism and yeah. negative groundswell behind it, still debuted at 50. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's still a brand. You also, yeah, there's is, still yeah. a brand in there. Yeah. The brand here for this movie is Pixar. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where you might run into trouble is the Pixar element still has a decent, the Disney attachment, I think, has has dragged the Pixar down a little bit. Um, I haven't seen a ton of marketing for this. Have you seen a not, massive not marketing Not other than campaign? being in the theater and seeing yeah, the colors. I think that's something too, is mm -hmm. I don't know that they've had a ton of marketing. I, 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 I do think they're not maybe sure how to market it. That's possible. That's part of it. Um, I can also say, looking at this, the early returns from the mm -hmm. box office, it's early release numbers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's already at $2.4 million. Okay. So... What does that say about where we're going? I here? still think we're less than 50. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's what I, I still think we're less than 50 on that one. Um, but it would be the, I mean, we're several weeks from Little Mermaid. So mm -hmm. it would be the one you take kids yep. to this weekend. Yeah. So that we'll have that. And none of the other stuff, if you've already seen Little Mermaid, none of the other stuff is really kid friendly. Mm -hmm. So I think that's your one. So that's its one potential. And I can say that as I've been wanting to do now during the podcast, communicating with other people or taking care of my own business when it comes to movies. Yeah, Rob that, likes to multitask. That I, that I have told uh, I have told my wife we're going to see Elemental tonight, and she said the reaction of my children, one was yes with four exclamation points, the other one was 
Y A S S S S S S S all capital letters to indicate their reaction. So fair enough. I yeah, you know, I think there are a lot of kids interested in this movie. Yeah, I would agree. So we'll we'll see. Uh, so I'm gonna say around. I'm gonna say 45. Okay. So so that my my final predictions on our flash at 85, um, mm-hmm. elemental at 45, and I don't I when we look back at like where the box office has been though, mm-hmm. I don't know if there's that much. Is there that much available? I don't know money in the box office. I mean, we are in the, we there. are in the summer now. Yeah. So that is a factor. Like more people go to movies in the summer. Kids are off of school. Like there's less distractions from that standpoint mm-hmm. so uh there tends to weekends tend to make more money overall but we'll see so you're going 100 and 135 what's... okay 100 for flash right. 35 for element element that's what yeah. be fascinating to see how this whole they were yeah. yeah all right so let's move on to our uh our discussion for the week and we're doing m- movie philosophizing again uh if you're just tuning in if you haven't heard this segment before it's where we take a specific aspect of a movie, a specific scene, a specific movie, something like that. And we debate or talk about the underlying philosophy of it. Uh, So Rob, you got something intriguing for us. So it actually relates to what we were just talking about, my my multitasking. So I've noticed more, I've I've noticed it myself more and more recently. And I, I don't know if you deal with this at all or know other people who deal with it. I think we all have different things that distract us, Mm -hmm. whether it's our phones or small children in your case (laughs) Um, or other things going on in our lives or work or whatever. Um, The home movie viewing experience. Mm. Are you able anymore to sit still and be completely undistracted and watch a movie? Because I find it really difficult. It's, It's hard. It is hard. Yeah. I was I was thinking about this n- not in that ex- those exact terms, but I was thinking about this very much recently. Like, you know, my kid goes to bed at like eight thirty, between eight thirty and nine. Mm-hmm. You know, my wife often will do the bedtime with him, and we'll come with her, and we'll come down afterwards. And so then we're having a conversation because we haven't been able to talk because because the, mm-hmm. <laughs> the little kid's been running our lives for the rest of the evening. Mm-hmm. And so by the time we get around to it, sometimes it's like 10, 10, 15, 10, 30, and I'm starting to wear down. And so that's my time for watching the movie. So I will find myself distracted by like trying to surf the surf my phone, mm-hmm. uh, watching, the, trying to watch the movie. Or sometimes I'm just tired enough where it's like, I want to be able to intellectually watch this movie. And the only thing I can do is just bed <laughs> mm-hmm. and so they're like it's affected what movies i watch it's it seems like it's affecting like my desire to watch a movie later in the evening as opposed mm-hmm. to like an hour-long tv show mm-hmm. um so yeah i found it more difficult i have found it more difficult recently to watch especially new movies that i haven't seen before mm-hmm. Um, it's not as much on movies I've watched previously because there's a le- element where you can have a little bit more distraction mm-hmm. when you already know the plot of the movie, yeah. especially new movies. Yeah, yeah, it's been tough. I mean, that's why I really like going to the theater. Yeah. Because for me, at least, I'm undistracted mm-hmm. there. Now, obviously, there are a lot of people there who still just stay on their phones the whole movie. Yeah, which so, is so annoying. <laughs> so, they're still, so they're still bringing that distraction with them. Yeah. But it's much easier for me to, like, I'm at my home on the couch. Like, I'm not mm-hmm. bothering anybody else by playing my baseball game or, you yeah. know, following a baseball game or whatever else is going on. Um, now, we, we have started to be a little more enforcing when it comes. So we have, in my family, just a little, a little background, we have family movie night. We try and do it one, at least once a week mm-hmm. where we rotate through who picks the movie, me, yeah. my wife, my two kids. And the rule of family movie night is whatever the person picks, you have to sit and watch the movie, even if you're not really excited about it. Yeah. Which when you have an eight year old and a 12 year old, <laughs> sometimes they pick the same movie they watch a thousand <laughs> times already. And so we're trying to enforce more like you're not on your technology yeah. like, during the movie, we're watching the movie. Yeah. But then like, I tell them that, but then I'm like looking at my phone. I'm like, what what am I what do I do? Like I'm supposed to not be looking at this right now. Yeah. And part of so part of this for me too is I've noticed that when I've actually like put it set it aside and and focused on mm-hmm. the what's happening in front of me, especially like 
with kids movies um like animated movies that i've i've seen before like there there was a movie recently and this is one example where i'm like this isn't bad like like it's a little better than i thought it'd be like i was just mm-hmm. saying some things about it my wife goes yeah we watched it uh like six months ago or whatever and you're on your phone the whole time <laughs> like uh, or like i'll be watching like a, an animated movie mm-hmm. or something i'll be like oh that looks really cool like, yeah. but i know i've seen this movie before mm-hmm. but i don't remember these parts of the movie yeah because i wasn't engaged with it yeah um how, I, do you have do you have any advice on like other than I mean, just like <laughs> other than keep your phone in another room <laughs> like that's the most obvious advice but uh, yeah. But I, I see this being like this is just a, a microcosm of society and we're it's, very it's true. We have very it's short true. attention spans, we're very distracting. And and I think there's it's 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 like dopamine conditioning, like we just open our phone. Whenever mm-hmm. we have whenever our mind is not fully engaged at that exact moment, the natural recourse is to open your phone. It's just partly it's habit, it's partly out of you know conditioning, it's partly you know, just what we've grown accustomed yeah. to doing. And yeah, I think it takes, it takes some like conscious effort to not mm-hmm. do that. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, you know, one thing I've appreciated about uh, some of these uh, online distributor companies like Netflix mm-hmm. and stuff, me producing things like Knives Out and other things like this is some, some of these things that you're, you're forced like at least for me, like I'm forced to mm-hmm. be engaged yeah. and like pay attention because this is something I actually want to see. Yeah. And if I don't pay attention, I'm not going to follow it because mm-hmm. I've never seen it. Yeah. And I think there's very, and, and maybe that's part of a problem with like Netflix and these other companies that there's very little that they come out with that is that way. Yeah. There's a level of, and I think this is true of some things like there's a level of disengagement with something. If it's just okay or it's just an mm-hmm. average, we're quick to, we're quick to make the flip. We're quick to be like, ah, I'm not interested in this. I'm going on. Yeah. You know, any of that type of thing. I think, I think that is, that is a reality mm-hmm. that is prevalent. And yeah, it's another good reason to just go to the movies. <laughs> and, and I think another, another aspect of this, mm-hmm. and, and this has been, you know, part of my movie watching journey over the last two years has been that I've been watching a lot more horror movies mm-hmm. or like thriller movies. And it's because I have a friend who I can talk to about them that we're like engaged with it. So I also think that's a big part of it because in your, in your scenario, when you sit down and you finally have time to watch that movie at 10 30, you're probably watching it by yourself. Yeah. And if, Mm -hmm. if, if you're not, if you don't have anybody to talk to about it, maybe not necessarily as it's happening, but like when it's over and you're like, Oh, I thought about this. And then like a week goes by, you haven't talked to anybody about it. (laughs) And that's why we have a podcast. Uh-huh. I watch my <laughs> crazy. Yeah. But I think a lot of yeah. people are dealing with that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. And yeah, it's it is it is fascinating. Um so like I said, not really a, a particular movie or movie mm-hmm. scene or anything, but it's something that I've I've just been ruminating on and you know, kind of trying to think of ways to challenge myself to be more focused and engaged when it comes to watching something that's supposed to be a visual art form yeah so it's not something that's supposed to be on the background we're supposed to be listening to mm-hmm. while we scroll through our phones we're supposed like there there's someone whose literal job mm-hmm. is the director of photography and his whole job is it's... to make this movie look like something we want to watch yeah so we should be watching it yeah <laughs> you know yes. i got gotcha. you totally that's a good one i like that one so that's your uh you know conviction for the week <laughs> This is not a Holy Spirit podcast. Hello. <laughs> He's welcome. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, my my movie philosophizing for this week is on the movie The Menu. Um, I've said multiple times I'm I'm following this weekly movie challenge, and last week's challenge was uh, to watch a movie that has something to do with the five senses. Hmm. Uh, so I chose. I just went through my list of movies yeah. that I have yet to watch yeah. and, and found the menu. I'm like, taste, there we go. We're good. And, and what's, what's fascinating about that is this movie actually is probably about all five senses. You could make a case. 
Uh, so I want to highlight there is if you've if you've have if you've seen the movie, uh, there is there is a lot of philosophical elements on a number of different levels. There's a lot of philosophical critiques. It has an inherent philosophical bent to it and, and the way it's done in the way it's orchestrated in the way the characters are written and developed and, and acted. Uh, it has a very philosophical root. Uh, so I, I thought I would pick out like three different elements and we can go back and forth because I know this is, this is a big uh, movie you, that you're a big fan of as well. Um, first off, it is, it is a critique of, I will say, critique of cultural elitism hmm. and the vast majority of the guests would represent the cultural elitism mm -hmm. and and what you see with the cultural elitism is you see that level of narcissism you see the narcissism of the cultural elites and and what you what what they're characterized they're characterized by this this willingness to go to virtually any level to maintain their status and the willingness to accept almost anything as long as it gives them a sense of moral superiority. Mm -hmm. And you see this a lot in the art world. You see utter garbage. That's what you just don't understand it. You mm -hmm. don't understand the mm -hmm. way it is. This is, this is, this is the height of intellectualism, you know, or what it is, or you see it, you see it play out in other levels of like indie music. Of people who are a fan of bands that nobody's heard of maybe even the music isn't even that good but they're fans of it and they get a sense of superiority out of them being one of the few who can do this one mm -hmm. of the few who can listen to this band who knows about them mm -hmm. and you you see it that it's really not about the music when a band like that gets popular and then the people who were fans of them turn around and hate the band now because now everybody else listens to them. Mm -hmm. um, so it's that kind of level of, of your, your, it's about what it says about you. And, and so there's a real critique of that kind of cultural elitism. And these characters, like as the chef gets more crazy and more ridiculous and more mad and on, the pretzels, they twist themselves up in to try and say, well, this is actually, no, 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 this is actually good. This is actually a high form of art. This is, this is amazing. Like I'm serving a bread course with literally no bread, but that's, I mean, look at him. He's an artist. He's a genius. Yeah. And, and because, because it's not really about that. It's about what it says about them, that they are there and that they get it. And so be will willing to twist themselves into pretzels to, to keep that status. And there's a real, there's a real sense of uh, deep insecurity about that. That's right through all of those characters. Mm -hmm. And, and it's written so well, it's, it's like they are um, a stereotype of cultural elites. Mm -hmm. And, and so there's a real critique of that, both from, from the level of above, from the chef, towards them and mm -hmm. from below which you see with Andrew taylor joy's character mm -hmm. um coming back to this so you have everyone kind of seemingly ready to jump off a cliff all together and one person standing back like um what's going on like right. this is ridiculous what's going on um and so then you have then you have um the the cult leader you have ray fines and and the chef is is the is the kind of prototype of a cult leader. Um, there's there's a narcissism level there, but what's what's deeply ingrained is in his character is a level of nihilism, and so the nihilism, the the meaninglessness of life has set in for this guy, mm -hmm. and and what you see very very well through this is is personal nihilism doesn't stay at personal nihilism hatred of your personal life and the meaninglessness of your personal life does not stay with you it then gets transmitted out mm -hmm. and and that's when it becomes really dangerous is when your personal sense of nihilism that life is meaningless transforms to life is actually bad and life is terrible and then you start inflicting that on other people mm -hmm. and you see this type of philosophy you see this in evidence on uh, Columbine killers were a great example of this, of their personal nihilism became a hatred of life itself, which then became like, we're going to take out life. Mm -hmm. And you see that same sort of spirit evident with 
uh, Ray finds in the chef is his personal sense of meaninglessness doesn't stay with him. He then transmits that to his team, the lackeys, the sycophantic uh, chefs who follow him wherever direction he is going. And then even to some of the cultural elites who want to bask in his glory. Um, I think there's also a sense of, uh, of kind of, oh, how do I put it? I, I made notes. <laughs> uh, oh, uh, it's, it's really reflective of self-loathing because mm -hmm. he is a cultural elite. He is part of that category that he hates. And so I think there's part of him that hates that part of himself that has become that. And so because he hates that aspect of himself, the fact that he's, he is like a part of this. Oh, we, I think at one point he says like, I'm just crafting things for, for people who do whatever. Like I've become part of this thing that I don't like. And so he turns around and takes that out on the people who he deems responsible for that. Most definitely like the one guy, the actors in there was just in there because uh, he happened to star in a movie that the chef got one day off and went to see the movie and didn't like it. Yeah. <laughs> and so like that level of transference on there is fascinating. Um, what, what do you, what do you make of, of that in his character? Yeah. I mean, there's, you, you in one, one aspect, they are like there to look good and maintain status and whatever. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a couple reasons for that. I think one, um, every person who's there is hiding something. Yeah. And if they can convince all these other people that they are happy to be here, enthused, like excited, mm -hmm. and they can make this all about that, then no one else will look into what else is going on in their lives. Yeah. And <laughs> the, the thing I really like about how the movie is written is it's really about peeling back those layers of, um, this person is hiding behind this person is hiding behind this. And really the, you know, the whole, the whole thing is about laying bare um, the lives of all these people, because it, for one reason or another, uh, the chef has an issue with them. Yeah. And I also think there's a level with each person of, even though they're there trying to convince other people about, you know, their standing and their importance they're all bored. Yeah. And I think this is pointed out the best by the the one couple where the chef directly asked them, how many times have you been here? Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, can you name any single thing that I made any of the other times? Yeah. And they they have nothing. Yeah. Um, because for them, it wasn't about enjoying. Mm -hmm. It was about um, projecting. Yeah. Projecting this aura of belonging and this aura of... Yeah superiority so when when you get to a point where you're only doing something mm -hmm. to make other people think a certain way about you yeah you lose your own enjoyment of it yeah and i i i think there's a caution in there for us because mm -hmm. i i don't think we're all at the level that we see in this movie these people mm -hmm. but i think every person has something that they have invested in and then gotten to a point where they're only doing it to maintain appearances, even yeah. if it's just with like a couple friends mm -hmm. and they just, they don't like it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's not, it's not a passion. It's not a hobby anymore. It's something that it's not, it's an obligation. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think there are all kinds of things that could become that for, and, for sure. And I think every single person in the world struggles with that, mm -hmm. no matter where you're, who you are or what yeah. your status is. Absolutely. Uh, which brings me to, I think the most, I think the most interesting character, and that's Anya Taylor Joy's character, uh, because all of a sudden, into the mix of this toxic stew between the chef and his uh, his associate chefs and all these cultural elites, drops this character who's not supposed to be there. Yeah, who is also in her own way pretending, but less pretentiously, mm -hmm. um, and she kind of represents like the average kind of streetwise uh savvy individual who's who's been around life who knows a little bit more mm -hmm. who knows the underside who knows the dark side of things who sees things a little bit more clearly 
sees things through the lenses and she is there to kind of um be the one to call like to call everything out to point everything out mm-hmm. to point out how ridiculous things are and and that is the foil off of which everything else comes but at some point and this thing is is this kind of group think mentality when that often sets in somebody needs to interrupt and point out like um guys no sometimes it really is just as it is sometimes it's not this giant panoply of amazingness or or it's a sometimes it's just dumb yeah sometimes something is just bad sometimes something is just wrong like you don't need to overthink absolutely everything sometimes you just need to call it out for what it is and and what her character what i love about her character and what it does is the way to tackle that the way to handle all this is one to call it out and b to stand up to it which is exactly what her character does Mm -hmm. the whole time she doesn't play along she doesn't give in when everybody else is like she represents that lone voice of sanity standing up in the middle of a room while everyone is careening off a cliff mm-hmm. saying like, um, I don't want to go there <laughs> and, and you shouldn't either. And so there's almost an, a, a level of when everyone else is crazy, the sane one is the prophet. <laughs> and so there's a level of that to that character. And, and I, I am, the best scenes in the movie to me are the ones where the chef is interacting with her or Ray finds and Anya Taylor joy are having their one-on-one interactions because they're just so packed full of, of like intensity and meaning in this because he just, in some ways he gets her and in some ways he doesn't understand her at all. And she is there to ruin his plans. And like the conversations around like, well, are you going to die as, one of them or are you going to die as one of us just it's really really fascinating i love those scenes yeah i mean looking at her character one thing i love about this movie and if you haven't seen this movie you need to see this movie i i the the i've watched it a few times more now and just the more i watch it the more i realize it's brilliantly right mm-hmm. it's brilliant yeah. Um, there is so much in this movie, and you know, we're breaking some of it down right here. But one of the main things that stood out to me was, and I love how they brought you along in this way, you don't realize who she is or why she's there mm-hmm. for a long time into the movie. And if people who if people who were there knew who she was, they wouldn't listen to her. Yeah. But because they assume she's just with this guy and she's just one of them, they're willing to listen to what she has to say. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a really good lesson on, you know, who do we pay attention to? Yeah. And why do we pay attention to them? Mm -hmm. Because she's the only one who's willing to be honest. And yet she's she's a call girl. Yeah. And none of them know it. But the only person who knows it in the room, well, the two people who know it in the room, I guess I guess the chef knows, too. But the chef, the older man and the couple, I guess he was with her. Yeah. And her date are the only three people who know what's going on. Mm-hmm. And it's it's it is fascinating to me how I I really I I think how she's written is fantastic mm-hmm. because and I and I think how they reveal things slowly is really well done too because yeah. I think a lot of characters in that role, that pretty woman role, that call girl role, whatever, they're they're never taken seriously. Yeah. And because of the mystery around her character, because of the confusion about why she's there, who she is, Mm -hmm. she's taken seriously. You take her seriously as the person watching the movie in a way I don't think you would if you knew right from the beginning why she was there. That's certainly possible. And I think her character is phenomenal and the when you mentioned the scenes between them the scene where she challenges him to make a cheeseburger Mm -hmm. like and you see him actually you see him have joy yeah for like one minute Mm -hmm. yeah it's it's fascinating and and that's what's great because because she sees she sees the underside she sees the dark side of people as and which is part of her occupation she sees the dark side of people the underside she recognizes that in everyone around the table she recognizes that in the chef 
in the way that everyone else, the sycophants around him don't see it. And then she's able to tap into, she's able to see him and for his personality the way it is and is able to tap into that in that scene. And it's really well done. So, yeah. If you haven't seen it, take a look. Yeah, put it on the menu. Put it on the menu. <laughs> uh, HBO Max, by the way, or Max now, I should, you know, just Max. Max. Just, just, just Max. Just, just Max. Just Max. Just Max. <laughs> Uh, let's close with a quick uh, quick watch list. What do you got? Um, so I think the only movie I watched this week was Family Movie Night last night, where I watched uh, Maleficent ah, with okay. Angelina Jolie, the first in the series. Mm-hmm. Um, very interesting, uh, different take on the whole Snow White uh, scenario, or yeah. sorry, Sleeping Beauty scenario, and uh, True Love's Kiss taking on a new meaning. Um, if you haven't seen the movie, uh, it's not the typical fairy tale you remember. Uh, but I, I thought it was pretty decently well done, and um, there's some good CGI in it. Angelina Jolie is pretty good as uh, Maleficent, the bad character. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, it was it was not the worst thing I ever watched. And my kids wanted to watch it, so there you go. it was good. Yeah, um, I will. I, so like I said, I'm planning on seeing two movies tonight, so I'll have more to report back on. Next week. I like it. Uh, the only other movie I watched this week uh, was one in response to this week's movie challenge, which is uh, something about friendship. So like, you know, a movie that has to do with friendship in some capacity. And so uh, I finally watched for the first time St. Elmo's Fire. Hmm. <laughs> I've never seen I'd seen most of the movies of that genre, of that ilk. Um, I had not seen that one. Uh, so I, I watched that one. Um Ultimately, it's just too attached to its time frame. Um, and so it was okay. But it it wasn't particularly... I mean, it was fine, but it wasn't per- something I particularly loved. I think it's just a little too attached to its period mm-hmm. to work. Um, it is fascinating to see some of those actors at that age. <laughs> like, it's got a very young Demi Moore. It's mm-hmm. got a very young Rob Lowe, uh, which Rob Lowe I can never take seriously. <laughs> I, just can't, I can't take Robbo seriously. Um, and, if, you know, it's got a lot of that cast from like the Breakfast Club and, mm-hmm. you know, all that, you know, John Hughes era uh, movie type things. Uh, so, yeah, I would just say, you know, outside of its time frame, almost 40 years later. Eh. <laughs> so, uh I know it's a classic, especially for people who were alive during that era. Mm-hmm. Well, I was alive. I just wasn't <laughs> that age during that era. Um, yeah. So uh, that's it. But uh, that is the podcast. Thank you for tuning into Film for Fans. Uh, share, tell your friends, all that stuff. We'll have some more Mission Impossible content coming for you next week. Keep checking back on the website as we'll have Mission Impossible 3's breakdown up this week. And hopefully Ghost Protocol within the next week, too. Um, but uh, tune in to Film Friends, check out the YouTube channel. Until next time, enjoy the movies.